Welcome to the Holy Sparks Podcast. Our mission is to illuminate the brightest lights in the Jewish world and beyond so that we elevate the Holy Sparks within us and make the world around us a better place. I'm your host, Saul Kay. If you're looking for inspiration, edutainment, or simply want to discover people doing amazing things in and around the Jewish world, you're in the right place. I also want to give a big thank you to our sponsor, JLTV, Jewish Life Television Network. JLTV is a 24-7 cable and satellite television network delivering news, history, and entertainment. JLTV brings together the greatest voices from around the country, across the world, and from the Holy Land. Go to jltv.tv for stories that inspire. All right. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Holy Sparks podcast. I'm excited about this episode. And without further ado, let me edify the man properly. Rabbi Yosef Goldman is a prayer leader, rabbi, singer, and educator whose original Jewish music is sung in synagogues and schools across the country and in Israel. As a ritual artist and composer, Yosef weaves together ancient devotional music from both his Mizrahi and Ashkenazi heritage, alongside contemporary American and Israeli Jewish sacred music, to create sacred spaces of healing, connection, and social change. As a Jewish spiritual educator, Yosef has served on faculty for organizations such as the Institute for Jewish Spirituality, Hillel International, the Rabbinical Assembly, and Hadar. Yosef's teaching facilitates deeper connection to authentic self and relationship with the divine through Jewish prayer and practice, including singing as an embodied spiritual practice. Yosef is also among the foremost American teachers of the text and music of Mitzrahi and Ashkenazi PU team, Jewish liturgical poetry. And he's a leader in bringing these powerful living traditions into the spiritual lives of American Jews. Yosef serves as senior advisor to Adar's Rising Song Institute and co-leads the Rising Song affiliated ensemble, Piyut Rising, that centers the musical spiritual heritage of Jews from the Middle East and North Africa. He lives in the D.C. suburbs of Maryland, where he serves as co-rabbi of Share Torah Synagogue alongside his spouse, Rabbi Annie Lewis, and his two kids, and I'm grateful to call him a personal friend, Yosef, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Saul. It's so good to be here and to be in conversation with you today. Absolutely. Thank you for making some time. So talk a little bit about, for people that don't know you, talk a little bit about your growing up Jewishly and and your early formative years. Sure. So I grew up in New York City in a modern Orthodox household. Um, Sometimes I get the image when I'm thinking of growing up of the Brooklyn Bridge because uh, we I grew up in Manhattan, um, but we would go about once a month to to Brooklyn, to South Brooklyn, to my mother's family, to my Yemenite and Syrian grandparents. So in Manhattan, we were going to all over, large modern Orthodox synagogues and the Hasidic shtibels. And regularly, we would go to pray um, with Shlomo at the Karl Bach Shul. And then we had this whole other religious experience of going to Sephardic synagogues, Syrian shul, a big um, focus on on the tradition of this of the Syrian Jews, and also kind of a pan Mizrahi place where there were Iraqi and and Egyptian, and you know the the, the whole mix. So growing up, I did not know many other people with, with any sort of Mizrahi heritage mm. in our, in, you know, in, in our, in our community in Manhattan. Um, but that was such a, a rich part of, um, of who I was, of, of the, the, uh, traditions and the music and the, the food of our Jewish home. My father of blessed memory, well, first of all, he was, he was a, a Baal Tshuva. He, um, his family was very Jewishly involved and very into into music, and he found a deeper uh, level of of Jewish practice in his in his college years with Reb Zalman Shechter Shalomi, mm. um, who was in Cambridge at the time. Mm. 
and Reb Zalman, in a, so he was doing all sorts of ritual arts with, and study with Reb Zalman, um, who is the uh, founder of, of Jewish Renewal. Um, Reb Zalman apparently sent some of his students to go and check out what um, what, what the Hasidim were doing. So he sent my father over to uh, to the Boston Rebbe mm. and uh, a modern Orthodox rabbi who was in Cambridge at the time, Rabbi Saul Berman. So that's how we ended up also with, with um, in relationship with Reb Shlomo. My dad brought a love of, of singing and music to our home and we were constantly singing. Um, the Shabbos table was full of song and we would sit and sing the Zmirot, the Shabbat table songs for, for hours. Um, also, I would say the table was the heart of my music education as well. Mm-hmm. You know, there did other things like singing in, in choirs from age four and studying instruments and stuff. But my harmonic sense um, and since the beauty of, of singing in harmony came from just sitting and singing Zmiros without accompaniment. I don't know if you've ever had this experience of, uh, of a group of harmony singers singing something that they've been singing for years and decades. And, and then you, you, you notice after a while, Hey, nobody's even singing the melody. We're all finding these other lines of singing this beautiful, this beautiful stuff. So yeah, so the, the, the music of the home mm. um, was core to my to my Jewish identity. Amazing. And were your parents, I mean, you know, I consider you a professional musician out, out there in the world. Were they that as well or more just singing in the home? My father was um, kind of a lifelong learner of music. I remember him taking um, auxiliary classes at, um, at Manus and Juilliard, singing arias and um and show tunes and um you know, uh, great american songbook and studied some um to be a, a lay shaliach tzibor a lay prayer leader but was not a um a professional but he was known for his voice he had a big booming baritone voice mm-hmm. and actually <laughs> there were t- times it, Several times when friends would come up to me and say, hey, I saw your dad. And I said, Dill, what do you mean? He didn't tell me that he saw you. He said, no, no, I saw him. He was on the other side of Broadway singing really loudly and I was looking for the voice and I, I saw him and just left him to his, his singing. Amazing. Amazing. Beautiful. And so did you go to Jewish day school growing up or Orthodox day school or public school? So I went to... Orthodox, Modern Orthodox Day School, Manhattan Day School for elementary school. I went to uh, Ramaz for high school, also a um, co-ed Modern Orthodox school. Um, and Ramaz was actually um, an, also a very formative part of my um, Jewish musical um, education. Um, Really grateful to Ramaz for their um, for their music education and their their choir and the chamber chorus. Mm. Um, now, Ramaz, I'd... is there any connection to Camp Ramah and Ramaz, or is it Ramaz with a Z? Ramaz with a Z um, mm-hmm. actually comes from an acronym of um, one of the uh, founding rabbis of the affiliated synagogue community, KJ Kilat Jeshurun. Mm-hmm. But that was where I really, um, I, like I said, I sang in a lot of choirs. I sang in a boys choir called Miami Boys Choir wow. um, growing up. Um, it's I, kind of a cross between the um, the Vienna Boys Choir and Menudo, but Jewish. For those who don't know. <laughs> a lot of falsetto involved. Uh, I got a lot of Yeah, and sailor costumes and, um, and all that kind of stuff. But it was in high school, um, you know, where we would really spend a lot of time working on the arrangements, working on blend and singing sacred texts that I kind of, you know, like I said, I grew up, I grew up praying and singing, but it was in those settings where I really felt what it meant to have a transcendent spiritual experience in a group through music. Mm -hmm. You know, when you work so hard at like, at transcending the, 
the pieces, the, the, the building blocks and, you know, the, the craft of it to create that kind of the art, the spirit and, and feeling what it meant to, to have the spirit when you brought on the full range of human voice together. Absolutely. So interesting. Okay. So, and in those choirs was the, uh, the Minhag to read music, sight reading or group sing or a combination of both? That's a great question. Um, so Miami boys choir, so it was a boys choir, um, it was a children's choir and was Orthodox. Mm. There were some children's choirs that I was a part of where the more classically oriented and there was sheet music involved and you know, that sort of Western approach to, to music. But um, the Mammy Boys Choir was, um, was more in line with um, how a lot of Jewish traditional music is, is passed along. You know, you, you learn it by ear and, mm. and you sing it, you know, the same way that I think a lot of prayer music and plasma music and, and other traditional and folk traditions are, uh, are passed along. And then in, in Ramaz, certainly we had our, we had our sheet music and um, just remembering, I think it was in the, the first year of Hazamir National Jewish High School Choir, mm -hmm. first branch of Hazamir, there may have been one in Boston, but the New York branch was meeting at our high school. Um, so that was also a, a, a choral experience that was formative for me. Amazing. And so talk about the transition from there to going to a conservative yeshiva, JTS. Right. So uh, eventually when I was um, in my late twenties, um, I entered the Jewish theological seminary um, first as a cantorial student and then as a rabbinical student. But um, there were certainly a lot of, steps along the way. So after Ramaz, um, I went to Yeshiva Kotel, is a, um, a post high school learning program in the old city of Jerusalem. Uh, there was a track for, there is a, a track for American students, a track for students from out, um, from international students, mostly American, um, but there's also a, a Hezder track where Israeli students are splitting the time over a course of several years between Torah study and, and their military service. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I spent two years living in the old city of Jerusalem with the um, it's an intensity, a spiritual intensity that often led to insomnia and just wandering down to the Kotel at, at all hours of the night. I can, I can attest I was just there and yeah. I've never slept so little in my life. And it wasn't just the jet lag. It was like waking up feeling like I don't want to miss any of this Kedusha that's here. I want to be present for it and I don't want to sleep through it. In Yerushalayim, in Jerusalem and in the country as a whole, there, there is there is that energetic, it's a different plane of, of vibration. 100% agree. Yep. So that was that was a formative moment. And then I continued at Yeshiva University for my undergrad education. Um, I think that was um, that was a time of already beginning to um, to look for um, I think a broader spiritual environment. When I was in Yeshiva Rakotel, I spent a lot of time studying Hasidut and um, really focusing on inner, the, the richness of the inner spiritual life, thanks to some, some rabbim, some teachers who really helped to guide me. Like when the Yeshiva had a whole, whole Yeshiva Shabbat, which was um, every several weeks, I was the one who led the tish after dinner and got to sing in a darkened room to lead the whole yeshiva in, in song. I think in the yeshiva university, which was focused a lot more on um, intricate Talmud study, um, is almost the sum total of the kind of daily religious practice. I, I, was, I was beginning to um, 
to kind of look for something else. Also, um, the home that I grew up in was very um, politically progressive. It was, um, you know, my, my mother grew up in a in a home in Syrian community where um, the roles, the gender roles, were pretty pretty rigid. My mother, my mother, was passionate about her own education and ended up with multiple um, graduate degrees and um, kind of put herself out outside of the the bounds of the community in that way it was a very powerful um, example feminist model for me and my father was was a, a serious activist is professionally it was a social worker and the, the board of ed and, and were emotionally disturbed middle school kids and but was very much involved in in causes in the city and jewish causes and so i was i was starting to look again for these you know progressive roots of my not only my my um my social identity my my you know my my civic identity but my jewish identity as well i spent some time at at um, a program run by the institute uh, drisha institute which is primarily for women's Torah study, but they were running a program called Hasha'ar, um, a program of multi-denominational Jewish education. When I left YU, I paused there for a year. Um, I think my my uh, motivation was that I wanted to I wanted to bring to to develop the language of of talking about the the spirit mm -hmm. um, to get out of maybe the the little the Daladamos, the, the 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 four cubits of kind of orthodox language, and brought in my ability to talk to people of all ages about um, about the inner life, about God. Um, okay. Can you pause for a minute there? When yeah. you talk about the Daladamos, the four blocks of, of orthodox experience, I think you said, or language. What do you mm -hmm. mean specifically? Daladamos refers to like the the, the um, the four cubits of, of the space that each of us takes up, and it's often used in a, in a halachic context as well. I meant that I was, I was learning about Judaism and talking about spiritual life in with a very particular context, in a very particular community, and using a lot of jargon. I, I wanted to kind of break down a lot of the assumptions of the language, assumptions that were possible to make because of that shared, uh, that sh the shared experience, and the shared uh, the cultural experience in the Orthodox community, um, and to really get at essence of what is it that we're talking about and how do we communicate about this. I'll give you an example. Um, when I got to Hashar, so there's a lot of it was a full-time graduate level uh, elementary, progressive elementary school education program. There was a lot of uh, time spent in, in teaching in classrooms as a student teacher. And in our own study, our time was split between uh, Torah study and pedagogy and education. And it was, you know, we looked at how we were learning text through the lens of, of pedagogy. Um, we started by studying Shabbat. And what that means is like looking without any commentary, opening up the Tanakh, opening up the books of the Torah, finding the root Shin Bet Taf, mm -hmm. that is the, the linguistic root of the word Shabbat, and figuring out in every context from Uvayom Shvi'i Shabbat Vayinafash, and on the seventh day, Shabbat, as a verb, God rested to when it becomes a capital Shin, capital S, Shabbat as a day of rest, and just looking it throughout into the prophets and saying, okay, on its own terms, what is the Torah saying that the Shabbat is? Mm. And as someone growing up Orthodox, we, there was never that pause. You read Torah, and immediately there is an overlay of Parshanut. Rashi, the commentator, says this. 
-hmm. the midrash midrash which is kind of filling in the broader story the broader meaning it's it's in some ways like torah fan fiction or it's like (laughs) it's funny i think of it midrash as the the white fire and tor and the letters of black fire of the torah beautiful so yeah it's 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 not the letter of the torah but it is it is the rich context of it as a learner it's important to separate those out so that you know what is the torah say what is the if i do if i give the torah the honor of a close reading Mm -hmm. what is it actually saying and then i can overlay Mm -hmm. commentary and understand what each of these overlays are commentary of of midrash and um and we studied shabbat in a multi-denominational group without talking at all about our shabbat practice Mm. just saying can we all give honor to the torah and hear what she is telling us about what shabbat is Mm. and then eventually introducing things like midrash halacha which is the part of midrash that kind of says okay how do we get from the torah to um to the, the lived practice of rabbinic Judaism. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we started in that context, once we had that shared foundation to talk about, well, so what does Shabbat look like to you, the reformed Jew versus you, the modern Orthodox Jew? And um, it was very vulnerable. And also very, it was, a, it was amazing to honor the Torah in that way. It was a real reset for me of humility it was it it was a real reset for me of humility to question assumptions i had about my relationship with the truth um that you know there is a capital t truth out there you know i firmly believe that there is a truth and we can get close to it in this world but we're in the end we can't whatever we are embracing is only pointing toward that thing and there's a humility there you know as a a 20 young you know young adult coming out of a modern orthodox milieu it was it was it really was an important paradigm shift for me and i was also i was i'd studied psychology and was struggling with things like you know still considering being like a clinical psychologist Mm-hmm. And thinking to myself, what do I do if somebody is coming in and struggling, let's say it's a, a child is struggling with their sexuality and say there's a, there's a conflict between how maybe I understand the letter of the law and the Torah and I understand my um, ethical obligation and the, the lived reality of this person that is coming before me. And thinking about well, maybe, maybe I have actually, I'm coming to an inflection point where I have to make some choices about the path that I'm going to take. And there are other similar issues of you know, Torah and ethical life. Long story short, I then I found myself saying, okay, I think I I need rabbinic training to um, to step into the path that that um, this vocational path mm-hmm. i went to shivar chovevei torah which um describes themselves as an open orthodox rabbinical school um kind of the progressive end of orthodoxy was founded by rabbi avi weiss um oh, were you there with rabbi sam feinsmith and david ingbar that whole cohort so rabbi sam feinsmith is a dear friend we actually were roommates for a time <laughs> Uh-huh. And still a dear friend, and David Ingber and I were chavrutas at some point. Um, talk about the white fire. I think we spent more time studying the, the white fire around the words of the page than than the the, the black fire. But um, yes, those are both dear chaverim, dear friends and confidants who who shaped my spiritual path. Amazing. Um, but then I. I it was so I was in this kind of left most or most progressive edge of the of the modern Orthodox world 
Um, and then I had an experience in, in my life, which kind of was a stress test for, for everything. It forced me very starkly to reconsider, um, my path. Um, it was 2006. I was still an Orthodox rabbinical student and, um, my father, uh, died pretty suddenly and he, he died by suicide and he was, like I said, he was a deeply, deeply spiritual man and brilliant person. And also someone who, um, was really, really struggled with the illness of depression. And that forced me to rethink, first of all, my, my community, what I needed out of community, what I want, role I wanted to play. And also it was a theological stress test. Basically the place where I quickly, um, retreated to in order to to rethink all of these things of, as a young adult was was the Jewish renewal movement I had, had been going to the the old Elar Chaim um, Jewish spiritual retreat center in Accord New York for um, silent meditation retreats and connected with you know, at the time um, a an intentional community called the Neshama community and uh, Sam and I and a couple of others had started kind of a multi-denominational monthly prayer community and started this independent minion that met in my home and the Elar Chaim folks would come down once a month. And so I, I, uh, I went up to Elar Chaim. I actually finished sitting Shiva up at Elar Chaim um, mm -hmm. because it was the day before Pesach, er, Shabbat, Erev Pesach. And had a powerful, powerful two seders with with some of the leading teachers of Jewish renewal, um, Arthur Waskow and Phyllis Berman led one of them, and um, Jack Kessler and 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 Marsha led the the other seder, and um, and then I was discovering the role that Reb Zalman had on my father's path. Mm -hmm. You know, it, I had known I'd known his name. But I didn't quite understand who he was. I didn't understand the role that, that he played on, on my father's spiritual journey. So I spent the summer up there as an assistant retreat manager. Came back to Chovitar for a few weeks and I said, you know what, this is, this is not for me. And, and went on a path of exploration that um, involved spending time at um, B'nai Jeshurun. Romamu was not in existence yet. But when Romumu started, I think it was that year, I was, you know, from from day one, I was part of the prayer team as a percussionist, as, as a singer, and a gabai, but also was, was exploring other forms of spiritual practice and community, like um, a dance of liberation with um, a friend Parashakti, where it was rooted in native, it is rooted in Native American traditions where with a lot of preparation, um, participants go blindfolded into a space um, and with live drummers and dance mm. for a couple of hours. And I was part of that drumming team and drumming with world music percussionists and um, visiting synagogues and prayer communities all around and just seeing where my soul resonated. Mm -hmm. and what, what I needed to do to rebuild. I went to JTS, I think, first of all, I was not interested at that moment in being a rabbi, but I wanted to say I wanted to be part of creating deep, transformative spiritual experiences through music and prayer. And so I went to the cantorial school. I, was, I still needed to be in New York, but New York is, you know, I, I spent 35 years in New York. I was not prepared to leave at that time. So JTS felt familiar, even though I didn't really have a, um, I didn't really have a foot in the Jewish, in the conservative movement. I went to JTS. And while I was at JTS, really the time, the, the communities that I was a part of where I, where I served um, were all large, multi-denominational, post-denominational, urban congregations, uh, CBST, Congregation Beit Simchat Torah, mm -hmm. which started as gay 
synagogue and LGBTQ plus working with Rabbi Sharon Kleinbaum, um, Romumu, where I was at, where I was still heavily involved, Bene Jeshrin, where I was the first cantorial intern, mm. um, also worked with the kitchen in San Francisco and Beit Fila Israeli, kind of a Chiloni synagogue in Tel Aviv and a Navatila in Jerusalem. And those were kind of the, the different spiritual homes. Uh, but I found, I guess when I was at Bene Jeshrin, BJ, which is tremendous um, music program and has influenced countless synagogues around the country, also have influenced by Reb Zalman in a way. When I was there, I, I realized actually I want to be doing a deeper work. And the work of the cantor it is very deep and holy work. For me, the path meant going back into the rabbinate. And I'd already met Annie, um, who was Annie Lewis, who was in the rabbinical school at the time. So I did, I was in both, I finished at the degree in both schools, but stayed at JTS with Annie. And that's, yeah. And then I came, that's how I found myself a conservative rabbi. Okay. So you brought up something very interesting. So you were doing cantorial work, cantorial solo work at BJ and other places, and you felt you wanted something deeper is what I, what I heard you say and moved into the rabbinate. Talk about that. Yeah. So if, if I said that, I, I what, do you, what do you mean? Broader, not deeper, broader. Okay. Um, okay, okay. As in they, like not just music. Not, not just, well, the, right. The, the canter it is deep work. There's a lot of space for cantors to be many different types of clergy, depending on the strengths that they're bringing and the institutions, right. you know, you could have cantors that are focused exclusively on prayer and, um, and ritual, including preparing children to reach the age of mitzvot, bar and bat mitzvah. Um, you have cantors that give um, sermons regularly or perform, you know, pastoral care and life cycle rituals. I think it, for me, it meant yeah, going deeper into, into Torah study and um, re revisiting Torah study and Nalacha and, you know, what my relationship was at that point and, and just rounding out both the education and the kind of the, the contours of, of, of what a future job. Uh -huh. Yeah. Got it. Okay. And then out of uh, GTS, where did you start in Philadelphia as a congregational rabbi? So we did start in Philadelphia. Annie okay. was a year ahead of me in rabbinical school. So she got a job at the Germantown Jewish Center as a rabbi. And I was commuting in my final year um, back and forth at the summer. When after she graduated, I worked at Bellevue Hospital, which is a large hospital in New York City that um, also has a very extensive, extensive um, psychiatric units um, and a level one trauma center. So I spent a summer doing clinical pastoral education there, and um, I felt I needed more. My first year out of the rabbinate was spent at Einstein Medical Center in Philadelphia, which is a level one trauma center in, in Philly, um, doing three more units of CPE a, as a chaplain resident. And that was a very different introduction to Philadelphia. I ended up, um, after that, serving the congregation in Center City, Philadelphia, BZBI. Um, oh, yeah conservative synagogue, wonderful community, but center city, Philadelphia is very different from North Philly where, where Einstein was. So I'm really grateful. I got to see different parts of, of the city where I served. And also, um, you know, I ended up at BZBI serving as rabbi and director of sacred music. Um, I'm really grateful to, to have had such a strong foundation in pastoral work, which you know, I think helped anchor for me um, this kind of, I don't know, a synergy of pastoral care, music and prayer and social justice as kind of being part of one, one whole of thinking about um, sacred relationship to self and other and the divine. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. 
It's funny. I played both those communities, the Germantown and BZBI. And I wonder really? if we're overlapped. I have to go back and look at the timeline where we have an overlap. Was DC the next stop or something in between? So I served at BZBI for about five years and um, we lived in Mount Airy, a wonderful community. And then we moved it to Center City where BZBI was. Mm -hmm. And along the way, I was making music with Joey Weisenberg, who was a teacher of mine at Hadar and then a dear friend and um, friend and mentor and collaborator. Um, I sang and sing with Joey in the Hadar Ensemble, which is the name of, of his band. He, his work for Hadar broadened into what is now known as the, um, the Rising Song Institute. And I was um, from the beginning, a, um, I don't know, an advisor, an advisor, a collaborator teaching in uh, their singing communities intensive I forgot what it was called in the past, but the, the winter um, immersive conference and Joey moved to Philadelphia and we were making music at BZBI and around the city. And um, had a, Joey had a dream of expanding the work of the Rising Song Institute, he was encouraging me to come and join him. Mm -hmm. And so eventually I did. And we, um, I came on as a co-director and we, ex we expanded pretty quickly. We had a full-time Jewish music residency program. Mm -hmm. First, we ran a, um, a fellowship for established artists, a, a small group of, of, of established artists that met every six months for um, a couple of years. Then this full-time residency program that we, were, that we were running in Philadelphia with some amazing souls and expanding the in-person singing opportunities and um, the recording output. Joey, um, Joey was kind of self-producing albums for himself and that developed into um, producing albums for other artists and um, kind of helped to establish what is now Rising Song Records. Kind of, it's still, you know, it's still part of a Jewish nonprofit, but is also an, an, uh, an independent record label. Mm -hmm. um, so there was all of this amazing expansion and then COVID hit. And so much of the work of Rising Song is about in-person group singing mm -hmm. and um, just had to contract big time. And so the, we had expanded so much and so I just couldn't sustain two directors and found myself again needing to figure out what i was what i was doing with myself i guess i should add i was also i'd been dealing at that point for at least a decade with some serious chronic health issues crohn's disease turned out to be all sort of colitis but i was in and out of hospitals and still you know the work of you know this very well the the, the work of a of a full-time clergy in a synagogue is is intense and i would you know into the hospital, come back out, go right back into communal work and um, was missing a lot of time with the family. And, and it was taking a tremendous toll on my body and on my spirit. Just after I started at Rising Song, ended up needing a, a surgery to, to remove my colon. And things kind of came to a head during COVID of, you know, immunocompromised um, from the illness, from the medicines. And um, it's just a moment where I really had to figure out again, like what, what am I going to do with this life? Yeah. I was still committed to the work that I was doing as an independent artist and educator, really getting into articulating ideas about prayer and um, connection to the soul, helping to expand the range of how we think about soul and practically connecting to our our neshama and what is healing practices for integrating our body mind and spirit and connecting with our ancestors and i really needed to, to step back and focus on 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 some deep healing work annie and i decided that we were going to try our hand at a co-rabbinate mm -hmm. um 
So it's not, it's, it's a relatively new phenomenon that there are, that there are married couples who are both clergy, who are co-leading a congregation. I know three other to give, couples. Yeah, yeah. Well, to give credit where credit is due, um, to a certain degree, I mean, this has been going on from, from time immemorial with a rabbi and a rebbitzin, the, the, the unsung hero of rabbinic families. But this idea of two clergy as on payroll, as, as the as both the leaders and the homemakers, it's relatively new. And so we thought, hey, let's try to lead a congregation together. And we're technically, we're each three quarters time to allow for some flexibility for our um, work-life balance, as well as our independent work as creative spiritual artists. And he is a tremendous writer and um, working on, on my music. And so that is how in the midst of COVID, we found ourselves in relationship with our wonderful community in Gaithersburg, Maryland, Shari Torah, that had been around for about 25 years with Rabbi Jacob Blumenthal, the founding rabbi who left to run the rabbinical assembly in the United Synagogue of Conservative Judaism, and, uh, and, and we're co-leading the congregation. And when it is good, it is very, very good. There's some things that when you know, when you have like husband and wife or siblings that are singing together, there's a blend that no other singers can get, you know? Yeah. So when we're doing that sort of that, not just singing, but when we're, when, when we're creating that spiritual artistry of communal leadership together, it can be profoundly beautiful and, and powerful. Uh, we're very grateful for, for this work and to be, uh, to be building with such a wonderful community. Absolutely. Well, I'm definitely going to do a podcast show with a bunch of the couples that I know, and I can do a little round robin. It's really, it's amazing. And I, Elon and I have that experience singing and leading together. It's yeah. not only the, the singing itself, but just the, the level of depth that you have, that you bring to the Bima and the community is, is innate and, and beautiful. Yeah. Okay. Let's talk a little bit more about music. I know that you have an album that's seems to be coming out in stages at the moment and then another mm -hmm. project you're working on talk about your your new I still yeah. call it record talk about that so with the with the help of god this album will come out august um, september 8th mm -hmm. i have an album called abita which is the follow-up to my debut album on rising song records grateful this one was not produced by rising song records but i'm grateful to rising song for releasing the album yeah, we've released a few singles so far, and thank God, um, been well received. This was an album, whereas the first album was recorded in the way that we that Rising Song does recordings. Everything's live off the floor, zero to minimal edits, overdubs. It's just the magic of creating in a room. We did some of that in 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 this album, and some of it. Um, some of it in, in a more traditional studio way because we recorded it in, largely in Israel. I'm here in Maryland and working with a, a wonderful producer, Yankala Siegel in Israel. Last summer, I spent a few days at Haogen Studio. Haogen, the anchor. It's a, it's a studio that's been around since 1975 and some amazing albums have been recorded there on Kibbutz Ogen. And then we've been building, uh, we've been building otherwise uh, between the two coasts, between with artists in Israel and artists in the States. And for me, it's an opportunity to take these ancestral heritages of mine where I've, I've spent a lot of, of my life now in deep study of, of Ashkenazi music, things like Nigunim and um, um, Nusach Atfila, prayer modes. And over the past many years now, I've also been studying Makam, which is the um, Arab musical mode system, which is also the, the basis of um, Middle Eastern Jewish prayer and song, bringing these parts of myself to the music as well as a whole range of, of, um, of musical influences 
that I was so blessed that Yankala was able to uh, to help me articulate and to, you know, I, I had a wish list of artists and he helped to to, to bring in others to, to, to fill out this range of, of musicians. Mm. And it also, it also integrates, I think, in, in, in new ways, ways of Jewish cultural and spiritual expression of American Jews and Israeli Jews and puts that into, into conversation. And I had, I had the blessing of, of working. I, I'm hesitating to mention any names because there, there's so many wonderful artists. I don't want to forget any, but I'll, I'll, I will mention some names and ask apology from anyone who I, who I don't mention, but working with them. Um, Yahala Lachmish, who is a tremendous prayer leader and Paitanit who's, bringing Ashkenazi and Mizrahi music in together, really representing Mizrahi communities in, in egalitarian prayer spaces in Israel. Got to work with folks like um, Chava Morel and Michael Winograd and Itamar Borochov, Yoni Batat, another dear collaborator. And I'll, I guess I'll also say that for me, I was very conscious of the creation of this album being a process of spiritual integration of some of these difficult experiences that I was just talking about, of um, being in places that felt really dark, mm -hmm. a lot of suffering and, and illness, and kind of still being willing to turn toward the mystery and ask again and again, where is the divine in this? Mm -hmm. And just kind of being willing to listen to whatever the answer was, even if it was silence or more mystery mm. and learning to, um, to find the life force that is present and, and the sacred that is present when you're willing to sit in the mystery and, and using the gift musical creation as a form of spiritual integration and, um, and prayer. So that was a very personal process for me, but I'm, I'm, I'm hoping you'll see, I'm hoping that it comes through in, in some ways and that it, can be meaningful and useful for folks on their own spiritual journeys and their own healing journeys as well. Beautiful. And I was going to ask you about this. So, you know, you've been on this big healing journey and, you know, you gave me some details here, but is it something that you, obviously when you're singing and you're praying, you're, you're coming out of your own life experience. So whatever you've lived until this point is, is coming out, right? Yeah. But are you, do you explicitly sing about it? Or is it more that it's it's your life experience infused through whatever PU team you're singing or whatever prayers? It's a great question. Um, I'm thinking about what, you know, in, in clinical pastoral education we talked about was the use of self. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we minister from our suffering. You know, that's a little bit of a Christian language, but that's you know, one of the things we talk about, Henry, now. And we, we minister... Um, from our suffering, which means like that there is there is some value that we can give to the people who we're encountering by bringing that to the forefront and allowing the wisdom or wh whatever we've gleaned from that to benefit the other. But it has to be done with a lot of discernment to be able to keep the focus the this the, the sacred focus on on the person who you're serving in that moment and not to mm -hmm. either disclose or or too much about yourself or in ways that are that are that are ultimately about yourself mm -hmm. so this is you know these questions come up when i obviously if, if people there were times in my life when people would, would see that I'm, even though it's an invisible illness, they would see that I'm suffering. Maybe I've lost a lot of weight or how I'm carrying my body. And so re recognizing, you know what, actually, this is a Yom Kippur when I need to talk about this. How do I do it in a way that is about what do we do when we're broken or when we are experiencing our vulnerability in really scary ways? What does it mean to be a community that holds the vulnerability where we can bring our pain and suffering and we can talk about illness in my music i guess on this album there is a couple of tracks ochila lael which is a part of um it's a moment in the chazarat hashats and the in the repetition of the, the the prayer leader 
you're pausing from the communal focus to say, I'm going to turn to God. Basically, I don't have in this body and with this tongue, I don't have the faculties to actually do the thing that I want to do, mm-hmm. whether it's through, through, through words or through the beauty of my voice to give voice to the, the ineffable and the beauty of God and what we're, all these things that we're, we're trying to accomplish on the high holidays. I don't have that ability. Mm-hmm. So just let me be a vessel. And that's true for any prayer leader. Um, that's true for any prayer leader, no matter how healthy they are in, in, in body and how beautiful their voice, let alone, you know, when you're experiencing physical illness and pain. So that's part of how I, my experience with this text and it goes into the music and the um, harmonization and the intonation and, and, and all, all of that. And there's another song about um, Nodi Safarta Ata, God, you've, the, the poet of Tehillim says, you have counted my wanderings. Sima dima ti binodecha, put my tears in your flask. Halo besifratecha, do you not keep an account of them? Just to say, it's a hope and a prayer and a, maybe a statement of belief that our suffering matters, that God cares and that there, that are that there's that there, there's there's something that comes from our from our struggle and from talking about it and bringing that into our conversation with God. There's and so Annie and I wrote that song together during COVID. And long story short, we, we wrote about it. We reflected on the Torah and on the theology of it, and even the you know the musical modes that are that are in there are um, reflecting this cry, this this um, this suffering, and it's you know, it's really rooted in our own experience, but meant to be a universal a, a universal expression <laughs> thinking of the hero's journey that you know you have to go mm-hmm. into the darkness the wild cave whatever the you know the, the metaphor is and come back and share but to not get trapped in the in the lake of you know the view of yourself the, the narcissistic trap it's like really we're we have to come back from that whatever it is we go through and get out mm-hmm. of the way so people can experience mm-hmm. the possibility of healing or transformation and i think mm-hmm. you, you beautifully said that so thank you for that yeah I want you to talk about you. You mentioned that you have a a PU team album that you're starting to work on, and it has to also connect to your healing as well. And I definitely want people to hear about it. Thank you. Yeah, we've been I've been studying with my friend Yoni Batat, who is plays violin and oud, and also is of Iraqi heritage. We've been studying Makam and um, PU team of um, Syrian and Iraqi Jews in particular for several years now with our dear teacher, Roni Ishran in Jerusalem, um, was a real holder of, of, of this tradition, particularly the Syrian tradition. We have been working up towards an album that we're going to record in November um, with the Rising Song Institute. And for now, the, the name of the project is Piute Rising. And as far as we know, it is the, will be the first album of this um, these musical traditions from Middle East and North Africa that both preserve the the quarter tones the, mm-hmm. the, the of the makam these are modes that have you know if you think of a piano and the twelve um, the twelve keys on the piano the Middle Eastern modes have tones that are between them microtones mm-hmm. um, so as far as we know it'll be the first one that that both presents this while preserving those tones and is in a mixed gender group 
go to Brooklyn and the Syrian community and hear this, this music. But um, a group of men and women preserving these and presenting them to the American audience is, is unique. Um, and our hope is to bring the, this musical and spiritual, spiritual heritage of Mizrahi Jews more to the mainstream of American, Ju Juda of American Jews. In Israel, you know, Mizrahi Jews are half or more of the population, and that's very much not the case in the States. Mm -hmm. But also, there are a lot of Mizrahi Jews in America who either didn't grow up in, in synagogues or with rich, you know, with these um, traditions in their home, or, or they did, and for whatever reason, left, either because of their commitment to egalitarian space or other parts of their identity, like their sexual orientation, gender identity, find themselves outside of, of the bounds of the community. And our hope is that it, this can empower um, Mizrahi Jews to reclaim their heritage, just as Yoni and I, who, like I said, I, I went to Brooklyn once a month, mm -hmm. but it wasn't really the core of my, of my, of my identity, of, my, of, of, of the prayer. You know, day to day, I was an Ashkenazi Jew. Um, so our hope is with this album, we're going to record in, in November. Yahala Alachmish was on my album, is going to be flying in. Um, there'll be other amazing artists and we hope to be able to perform it and then to, and to teach about the poetry and the music in workshops and also to, to bring it into um, ritual spaces, more Jewish ritual spaces. There's such beautiful poetry and music and finding new ways for this to enrich Jewish sacred communal spaces. I love it. Definitely look forward to that as well. And so as we wrap up here, I, the question I always ask every artist, a rabbi or cantor or author that comes on the podcast is, what do you feel the Jewish world needs now most and why? It's a small question. Um, what does the Jewish world need now most? A little bit of generosity of spirit and assumption of good intention for other Jews. You know, that, that ability to pause before we judge and sum up what the other is all about um, and what we are all about. And I think that sort of humility that maybe we don't know everything and maybe we can't sum everything up. And that's the true, true about our own experience as well. I think that if we can, if we can make that pause in our relationship with others, that it can also make that pause in our relationship with the divine, with ultimate truth, that maybe there's something much bigger than what we experience day to day. Maybe there's a, a reality that maybe we can actually bring into our conscious, our consciousness, if we are able to, to be comfortable sitting in the mystery. Beautiful. I love it. Well, I want to end with a blessing as I do with everyone that comes on the show and, mm -hmm. and Hashem should bless you that your, your healing journey should inspire others to continue when it gets hard and that your music, both liturgical and otherwise should be well received by communities that don't even know they need something new, but when they hear something, it provides a deeper way into connecting with Torah and with each other and that it should open up the gateway of acceptance and uh, chesed hmm. and more simcha and ahava between Kol Yisrael and Kohal Amen. Can you hear us so? May it be so. So it's Friday afternoon. I want to wish you a Shabbat Shalom. It was so wonderful to talk with you, Saul. Thank you for inviting me on and for creating this space to uh, for us to to hear from so many wonderful people in our community. Absolutely. Thanks so much for your time, brother. Shabbat Shalom. And we'll talk soon. Yes. Thank you so much for tuning into this week's episode of the Holy Sparks Podcast. I'm your host, Saul K. Please subscribe to the channel. It helps us more than you know. Drop a review. Share this with friends and family, people you think would enjoy the content. And we'll see you on the next episode.